Hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines tonight with the documentary maker, Jenny Kleeman, and The Sun's managing editor, Stig Gable. Very good evening to both of you. Uh, first of all, let's see what's on the front pages, shall we? The Telegraph leads with a report of a breakthrough for blindness as surgeons say they found a cure to reverse some types of vision loss. The front of the metro focuses on the latest findings from Mars, that water flows on its surface, raising hopes of life on the red planet. The Financial Times reports that shares in trading house Glencore have suffered their biggest fall, prompting one investment bank to say its equity value could be wiped out. On the front of the eye, Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn promising to put kindness back into British politics when he addresses the Labour Party conference tomorrow. The Guardian also leads with Mr Corbyn's first conference speech, where he will tell supporters he loves his country. The Daily Mirror, focusing on that too, it's being called a patriotic vow by him. The Daily Express leads with a study which has found people with high blood pressure are 60% more likely to get diabetes. The front of the Daily Star reports on brand Beckham, with experts saying David and Victoria Beckham are now richer than the Queen. But with fewer palaces, I think, probably, <laughs> don't you? That's true. Uh, it's not true anyway, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, Jenny and Stig are here. So, um, Corbyn's big speech to conference tomorrow, all over the papers, The Guardian. British values are my driving force. Apparently tomorrow, Corbyn is going to say, I love my country, I love my country. And he has to say it because, of course, uh, he was caught out not singing the national anthem at the veterans event and this really says something about British politics and what makes British politics different because when, it, when he was caught out not singing the, nat the national anthem it was the same time as Trump was giving was part of those big Republican debates and I was thinking in America can you imagine if you wouldn't sing the national an anthem and in American politics you know you can insult someone's wife and and get away with it in British politics, you can't, but you can you can get away with not singing the national anthem. But he's having to assert the fact that he uh, loves the country, that he's patriotic, uh, that he's not just going to be an antagonistic person. He's trying to promote a kindness in politics mm. and a kind of authenticity. It's, it says in the piece here, which I find very interesting, that uh, he's going to be using an auto cue. And what's so funny is that nowadays using an auto cue is a sign of authenticity because everyone knows that when you learn your speech off by heart you're not just talking spontaneously off the cuff um, it is all you know prepared to the nth degree and you forget paragraphs like deficit yes and uh, important things so um this is going to be a different kind of speech his wife isn't going to come up and give him a kiss at the end there's not going to be pyrotechnics but this is the first time we're really going to see him lay out Which his stall i'm kind of pleased about i yeah, find the wife introducing so. the position is so sickeningly and sort of crassly false it's always it's sort of mm. making makes you feel full of... And American as well. Yeah, yeah full of contempt for the political classes it's that insincere. you see it happening. It's totally <laughs> insincere. And, and what Corbyn has to trade on, which is interesting why the I love my country line is coming mm. out, is what a cynic might say, if you have to start off your pitch to be the next Prime Minister <laughs> at the end by clarifying that you love your country, you probably haven't necessarily conducted yourself brilliantly in the first uh, few weeks of your reign as leader of the opposition. It's like you have to say, by the way, I really do like... Britain and I'd like to be leader of it. It's not the best position he's doing. But the authenticity point he's he's trying to trade off, I think is a genuinely interesting thing that he's trying to do. He's trying not to be too he actually wants to be a bit clunky, a bit scruffy, to read an auto cue badly mm. uh, to sort of say I want to be about niceness and kindness and genuineness it's very easy to sneer at it and I obviously occasionally find myself doing it but he is definitely a product of a f of a backlash against the disgustingly bland oversimplified over media trained monkeys of the political classes and he is a legitimate counterpoint to that in the same way that Farage was in a kind of the mm. same way that Trump is in America so when he talks about niceness and not being horribly top-down and when he tries to make a virtue of the chasms within the Labour Party, as John McDonnell did by saying, it's not all about wh whipping the party line and being uniform. Part of it is them trying to justify the, the absolute mess the Labour Party's in, but there is a little nugget there to people saying, actually, I do quite like independence of thought, and I do quite like it when people but genuinely disagree, because that's what the real world's like. The real world is actually complex and difficult and hard to agree upon, and the world of Westminster often feels kind of shiny and simplified and insincere, and there's a kind of nugget of something he's working with. There. And he, he has a massive mandate, this is the other thing. He, you know, 60% of, of voters voted for him and didn't vote for the other three who were the, the very essence of this particular kind of managed new, new Labour. So there's definitely a first 
a first for him, obviously, and I think people, he, he will be very highly scrutinised, like he was in his first PMQs. But even then, it was, I think, it was a bit of a disappointment to some people, his first PMQs, because there wasn't much, you know, he was there with his glasses on and not, not performing very much, and there wasn't much to comment on, really. Uh, he was doing what but he said he was going to do. That is the new politics, is that, that it isn't about performance and show. It's, it's, and it's not even necessarily about policy, it's about uh, ideals. Yeah, but eventually those. it will be. That's the point, it isn't has it? to be. This sort of committee deciding policy will eventually have to come with a reckoning. There has to be agreement at some point. And also there's got to be... Yeah, ab, yeah, ab, Before the elections next May, for well, example, but, but, is that when They've got to agree policy. Well, actually, in the way that opposition often works is you don't want to overcommit to policy uh, uh, too early. Both the Tories in opposition mm -hmm. and Miliband in opposition, for the little it's worth, you don't overcommit too early. But you're absolutely right. At some point, you've got to be pragmatic. The lesson of Tony Blair, the arch pragmatist, was what do you do to get elected? Mm -hmm. If that means that you go to the centre but you keep a, a, a useful idiot like John Prescott to keep the left of the party happening, if you compromise to get what you want, that's fine. And what uh, and you'll have to see with Corbyn and McDonnell at some point is what are they going to compromise what are they going to do to try and be electable because that in the end is what their job is to do and if you saw it today with, with McDonald's speech it was very light on policy mm. it was always it was supposed to be the new dawning of a of an era and actually he ended up trotting out mm. quite a lot of platitudes but, but he did you, say his speech was going to be boring though he was right yeah. <laughs> well, but if you look at the uh, one of the columns here in the in the Guardian privately shadow cabinet Members acknowledge they are systematically trying to push Corbyn as hard as they can, including by challenging some of his most expensive leadership pledges, including abolition of tuition fees. So the dissent within the shadow cabinet is still really. The shadow cabinet is still a product of the politics in this country, and that is a politics mm. of uh, being very professional politicians, to, 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 to being whipped through to trying to come up with uh, shiny policies that you think are, are going to make you electable. There's nothing wrong with that, but Corbyn is trying to stand slightly to one side of that, but he's going to get caught again and again by saying it's all very well being idealistic and committee-led yes. and beard-stroking. In the end, you've got to try and do something that gets I, you elected. I think what the issue for the Labour Party is that I think the consensus is now that the reason why they lost the last election wasn't necessarily because they were too left-wing, but was because they didn't have economic credibility. They were not trusted on the economy. And that's why the kind of grand promises that he made in the leadership contest, they need to be, the figures behind them need to stack up and it needs to be provable. They have to show that they're uh, credible when it comes to the economy. And so that's perhaps why, uh, you know, John McDonnell wasn't very, wasn't very specific. Although in party conference speeches, you aren't too specific on but policy, But you, you were specific about one bit you've picked out yes. in the Daily Express, which yes. is about tax avoidance. Yeah, tax avoidance by the big corporations. Which is massively, massively frustrating to any observer because all politicians do this. And Jeremy Corbyn identified £120 billion. He has a tax guru, guru called Richard Murphy who spent his life looking at the tax. He hates tax evasion and tax avoidance, and he's very passionate about it. And so he's come up with this figure, £120 billion between the tax that's actually paid and the tax that's owed. And that's considered £120 billion the Exchequer should be receiving. Of course, you never, ever could receive that. And Corbyn kind of implied you could, and that was how he was going to fear, fill some of the economic black holes. McDonald now is sort of saying, well, it's probably £20 billion. But in the event, the two great lies in any form of economic discourse is that you can always get more money by cracking down on tax avoidance and you can always get more money by, by decreasing waste. They're two things you can say without hurting anybody that matters by looking like you know what you're doing. And actually, in but five it, years' it time... It plays to the left, doesn't it? It does. And I, but I think it's the greedy corporations, it's the bankers that yes. cause the crisis and it's the, the middle, middle class and, and low-income earners who are paying for it. And that's I, the point I think of them. the phrase corporate welfare is going to play very well with the left. Uh, and this idea of kind of benefits, uh, you know, that it's the, the, the benefit scroungers that have been, that have had such a tough time, but there are corporate benefit scroungers. That's going to play very well. It, and it plays well as an ideal, but it's jibber but, jabber, but no, isn't it? It's, it's platitudinous. To, to be totally fair, I, I wouldn't agree with you there because he did, I mean, what was funny about this speech is he did talk about a lot of, you know, this is meant to be a big revolutionary speech, and really what he was talking about was a lot of reviews, reviews of HMRC and yeah. of the Bank of England and the Treasury, but he did say there was going to be a review of how we could get big corporations like Amazon and Google to pay more tax. So it's not, a sim not si as simple as going through the accounts and seeing where it's being avoided. It was seeing what can we, what can we do to make it even harder for them to, to avoid tax. But, but, yeah, but, really but yes, it wasn't a revolution. It was, let's have a review. Let's mm. go and get someone vaguely clever to have a look at it. And I think people were, were expecting a bit more... 
fireworks, maybe. Yeah. Um, let's move on to other matters. Lots more coverage of Corbyn tomorrow, of course, because his speech. He's going to be wearing a suit. Starting. That's why I put on a suit today, just just in, no tie, in, in homage. Well, and I the beard, I'm sure. As I well. have a straggly, <laughs> I have a straggly, scruffy beard in constant homage I to Jeremy Corbyn. I didn't realise you were a doppelganger for Corbyn, but there we are. Um, <laughs> meantime, down the bottom of the Telegraph, you've got the Corbyn story, but you've also got the events at the United Nations. Putin snubs Obama on Syria. Their head-to-head -head meeting currently underway. These bilaterals are always extremely un uncomfortable between yes. these two Particularly leaders. Those two, I yeah. think this just goes to show how formidable ISIS is, that you have America willing to cooperate, as, as uh, Obama said, with Iran and Russia if necessary. The fact is that our strategy and us being uh, Britain and France at the US are strategy against ISIS has not worked. We need, another we need another strategy and we need Russia because Russia are able to talk to Assad and, and we're not. It's very interesting in terms of what this allows Putin to do. He is once again at the centre of the world stage. He is uh, clawing back, to, back a bit of diplomatic clout that he lost ever since Ukraine. Perhaps this is an opportunity for, uh, for him to, to get the sanctions against Russia eased. He's enjoying every minute of it, as you can see um, from the interviews. But Having not been to the UN General Assembly yeah. for no. some years... And I don't buy any of this, really, because if you looked at it, uh, mm -hmm. Putin refused to be in the chamber when Obama was speaking. Obama wasn't in when Putin was speaking. Mm -hmm. Obama stands up and says, Assad threw barrel loads of chemicals on his own people. Putin stands up and said Assad is the legitimate leader of Syria. So for all this talk and the incredibly awkward bromance that will be going on at the minute in this bilateral, they are fundamentally opposed. One person thinks correctly in Obama's case that Assad is a vicious dictator and the other one thinks he's the legitimate leader of Syria. And it's very hard to see but how sadly, those two things can, can actually meet. They have to cooperate if we're going, if we're going to mm -hmm. change anything in, in Syria because at the moment our strategy is not working and Russia can offer a different path. Although Russia says the only legitimate troops on the ground in Syria have to be Assad's troops and we need to be funding and supporting Assad's troops, which is a kind of insane... And is that the moral price? It's an interesting question you end up with, a moral dilemma. Is the moral price we're willing to pay to destroy ISIS propping up Assad, who only two or three years ago we were all correctly recognising as someone who's chemical be. weapons on I think it may be. I, you know, what other solution is there? Because we've tried another way and it's not working. We'll see what comes out of that meeting, certainly. Lots more still to come. We will take a sounding of what uh, life really is like at the Labour Party conference in Brighton with Andrew Pearson and Kevin Maguire, who are standing by for us right now. Uh, back in just a moment. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me this evening, Jenny Clement and uh, Stig Abel. Uh, and also joining us from Brighton, we've got Andrew Pearce and Kevin Maguire taking a sounding for us. This man, of course, dominating, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, let's take a sounding from you. Who do I start with, the, uh, the Labour man or the antithesis of it? Is it exciting to be there in this brave new world, Kevin Maguire? I know, you should come on down. The water's nice, you know, get in there. It's, there's actually far more people at this conference than there have been at other conferences for, for a long time. They're all excited. There's a lot of enthusiasm. It's a younger crowd. He's really cheesed off and uh, hysterical <laughs> and weeping and a jabbering wreck most of the time because it's going quite well for them. John McDonald's speech today was coherent and compelling on an alternative to uh, austerity. And why, why cut the uh, living standards of ordinary people or the standards they use when they didn't cause the, the crisis. And I love the Tory attack uh, ad on Labour, going you know, on about the Weimar Republic and so on. Because George Osborne's just printed more than £100 billion in quantitative easing. It's kind of crazy Tory attacks. I think they're rattled now. He's certainly rattled. Um, you you see, know, he's rattled, you, you can know, see already. He's almost as deluded yeah. as Comrade Corbyn, this yeah. bloke, isn't he? I mean, my God, that speech by uh, John McDonnell, he didn't tell us anything about how he's going to pay for this great new revolution. Uh, he's gloomy, he's doer, and we're going to get a speech tomorrow from uh, Comrade Corbyn, who's never used an autocue before. My God, what's that going to be like? Another car crash, I imagine. And when you wander around this Congress Hall, far from this great sense of excitement, there's a lot of people who are utterly bemused because they don't know what's happened to their Labour Party. I saw Peter Manderson, remember him Anna, used to be a great figure in the Labour Party, wandering around all on his own and I said to him, Peter, why are you here? They don't want you here anymore. The Blairites who won three, lots, three general elections are not welcome. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he said to me, I'm not going queue, anywhere. A little style. 
<laughs> but of course he's not going uh, anywhere. He's, um, look, all political parties are broad churches. People always fall out. Next week will be at the Tory party. They'll be falling out over Europe. That's just what you do in a, in a party. But you go on about the autocue. Just picks on a little stylistic issue. Doesn't look at the big substance of the policies or the change in politics or the fact that more people voted for Jeremy Corbyn than the Tory party has members. And actually, there is something changing. People want politics to be done in a different way. Yeah, they don't want to, yeah, they don't want to see well, leaders with thousands. Thousand pound suits, and uh, I wouldn't wear yeah. I wouldn't wear socks and sandals as a combo the way Jeremy Corbyn does when he's relaxing in his what hotel room. Vests? I wouldn't do. Would you wear those vests? One pound fifty. Uh, the market quite a lot up, for uh, you. Holloway That's Road. quite expensive you know, for you, actually. I suppose you'd uh, crochet yours out of <laughs> silk or something. <laughs> but, you know, there, is a, there is a, there is he's a completely different bought politics. into this. He's no, bought no. into this complete. Yeah. Tra it's complete rubbish. It's not a new politics at all. They've already backed down on Trident. That was going to be the great new revolution. Back down. You know. There's, there's uh, compromises on? On. going on, on all over yeah. the place. It's not new politics. And this time next year, the left will be completely in control of this Labour Party. And you watch the blood being shed then. Oh yeah, he was like he was like this about Ed Miliband. He was a like this about and Tony. He lost. He and was, I was right. He, was a like this about <laughs> he lost, Kevin. You were like, you were like he this lost. about Tony Blair. you think he remembers Tony what Blair happened in the election? And, and Tony Blair won three times. You're just always on that same cynical, complete, you know, as loud as you can, maximum decibel knock everything that's changing because you're afraid of change I suppose you're a true conservative like that you're just stuck in an old way of doing politics and I just find it quite interesting I think it's exciting it may not fly for Corbyn it may all it may all crash but it is exciting it will crash <laughs> just, not sure, note, on that just not sure when <laughs> Andrew see Pierce, Kevin Maguire I mean. um, enjoy yourself I think you are I fear you <laughs> are anyway <laughs> is that really the new the, it's not really the new politics is it the, the, the two of them <laughs> Did we learn anything? Was that a bit like John McDonald's speech as far as Andrew <laughs> Pierce is concerned? Um, anyway, shall we move on? Lots more of that to come this week, no doubt. Yes. Rivers of Mars, very exciting. Hello there, you're watching Sky News and the press preview. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the newspaper headlines with documentary maker Jenny Kleeman and The Sun's managing editor, Stig Abel. Good evening and Good welcome. Evening. So, front pages, first of all. The Telegraph leads with a report of a breakthrough for blindness as surgeons say they found a cure to reverse some types of vision loss. The front of the Metro focuses on the latest findings from Mars, that water flows on its surface, raising hopes of life on the planet. The discovery of running water on Mars is on the front of the Times, which also reports that millions has been spent on help for heroes centres where beds are empty. The Financial Times reports that shares in trading house Glencore have suffered their biggest fall, prompting one investment bank to say its equity value could be wiped out. On the front of the eye, Labour's leader, Jeremy Corbyn, promising to put kindness back into British politics when he addresses the Labour Party conference. The Guardian also leading with Mr Corbyn's first conference speech, where he will also tell supporters he loves his country. The Daily Mirror going with that too, which says he's been called a, or it is being called a patriotic vow. The Sun says that a scientist found evidence of water on Mars. Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell told supporters at the Labour Party conference that another world is possible. The Daily Express leads with a study which has found people with high blood pressure are 60% more likely to get diabetes. The front of the Daily Star has the headline Posh and Bucks and reports on experts saying David and Victoria Beckham are now richer than the Queen. And the Daily Mail leads with its own investigation into the out-of-hours NHS hotline, which it claims is in meltdown in parts of Britain. Well, let's get the thoughts now of Jenny Kleeman and Stig Abel, starting with your paper. Um, wow. Interesting. Do you see what we did there? I, I do see what you did. Well done. Clever, combining Clever. the two major stories of the day in one visual metaphor. Um, it's, it's based on McDonald's speech, obviously, where he said he wants to create another world. Uh, and it's this, this the narrative of the new politics that uh, everyone is so desperate to try and convince themselves exists in the land of Corbyn. And it's either a new politics or it's just a curiously inept version of old politics, depending on how uh, you cut your political cloth. And, and this is the, 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 what they're trying to do, Labour, with some success and with some justification, is to mm. say, you at home are sick to death of shiny-faced, lying politicians who spend their lives being endlessly manicured by media advisers so they never say anything, they just trot out party lines, they're boring, they never say what they think. And what Jeremy Corbyn wishes to do, because uh, he has to, is try and harness 
opposing views with his own party because he's created those opposing views because mm -hmm. lots of people in his own party disagree fundamentally with everything that he says. So the try thing he's trying to do is say, I'm not going to be like the traditional politicians. I'm not going to expect everyone to agree with me. I'm not going to enforce a party whip on issues like Trident or Syria. I'm going to be different. Mm -hmm. And there's something in that uh, from their point of view. And if you look at the pictures, quite different to Ed Miliband a year ago where he's swatting to memorise his speech. This is autocue, the first time Jeremy Corbyn's going to use autocue. And he's out tonight at a diversity disco in Brighton. And he's a terrible orator, which is really interesting as well. You, you think when you, when you kind of hear of uh, Corbyn, you, you know, a person from the far left who's grown up in stump speeches, <clears throat> 30 years in politics, you kind of imagine him will be a real firebrand. And then when you see him speak, he's a sort of rambling librarian figure who kind of is just saying what occurs to him, which is then again, there's something in this. That, that is all that part of his appeal. His yeah. appeal is being an, uh, a deconstructed, uh, authentic, unspun politician, mm. and that's why people voted mm. for him, because they were, they were sick of it. I mean, the, the, the sun's coming down. I know, I know you've, mm. you've gone away from it now. But I, have, I can go back. Uh, it's fine. What I find very funny about this is <laughs> we're going to have this for another five years at least from, yeah. from the sun uh, of kind of this complete ridicule and, and it says here hard left labor yesterday unveiled a catastrophic catastrophic tax and spend economic blueprint guaranteed to bankrupt britain which is not what i heard i heard quite a dull and quite a tame speech where lots oh. of reviews were suggested yeah. reviews into the hmrc and the bank of england uh, and That's the treasury free speech for you jenny uh, you know <laughs> and and of course you're very welcome to it i mean i think perhaps this is what a lot of commentators on the right wanted uh, mcdonald's uh, speech today to be. It wasn't really, it was all a bit safe and I think it's probably going to be the same tomorrow for Corbyn. Corbyn is going to have to say, make very clear, and, and the papers here who obviously had a preview of this auto-cued speech uh, <coughs> and, and said that uh, he's going to say, I love my country, I love my country. It is quite amazing that the leader of a major political <coughs> party in this country uh, is having to say that they do actually like the country that they want to lead. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, there's there, it, it is, I think it says a lot about this day and age that uh, he, there's something revolutionary about the fact that he's reading from an auto cue mm. because we all know now that when politicians stand up on a podium and apparently a appear to be speaking spontaneously, they are in fact speaking something that they have learnt by rote or forgotten, uh, as was the case with poor, poor Ed Miliband. And, uh, and you know, we, I, we read from, from tomorrow's papers that it, he's going to be doing it in an unspun mm. way. His wife isn't going to come up and give him a kiss. There isn't going to be pyrotechnics. I wonder what music he's going to come on to. Uh, but again, there's, not, there's, there's going to be a lot, of, um, a lot of kind of expressions of principle, but not a lot of uh, plans for policy, I don't think. But it's early days in, in the Corbyn leadership. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, he has time uh, to reveal what his actual plans are. Uh, and it, it's just going to be him reaffirming what he stands for. And lots for. of people saying that this British values are my driving force, I love my country businesses, to answer the criticisms well, about the anthem. Yeah, yes. well, it, it obviously the veterans. Is. Which is it's kind of an interesting example of him uh, playing the game of presentational politics, because, mm -hmm. of course, he didn't sing the national anthem because he is a ardent Republican. He doesn't believe in, in the monarchy. Um, uh, and so he's now having to respond to that by saying he does love his country. Do you enjoy that headline? <laughs> so, no, I do. I got the headline, but I've just noticed you talked about the wife not coming on stage, but you've picked yes. out the awkward moment where Corbyn kisses his old flame Diane Alford. I know, <laughs> and also a terrible picture of nose squash going on there. I mean, no, it, it's a romantic ge gesture between two I, old flames. I can of the see left. how this is going to yeah. go on, which is, you know, Corbyn. <laughs> this, the, the, the thing is, this is the, the politics the of when women are you yes. know, in power and you talk about their clothes. You've got an article there, Dither on Suit, a well, there we go. Up, well, at and least Jeremy Corbyn. I'd go for that. Hang on a second. Hang on a second, Bottom. This is an example of equality in action. We are being snooty and sniffy about whether he's going to wear a suit. And there is a broader point with him. Is how much is he going to smarten himself up? How much is he going to wear the kind of uniform and polish of the professional politician? Because he's been elected as the scruffy git from the 1970s. Uh, that's the thing is, is though, git. Is now he's said it twice. Really twice now. I don't think it is. The thing is, though, that there is this attrition of, of, of ridicule of, of the Labour Party. I say you know, there, there was, get myself. That's three times. <laughs> there was Miliband and the bacon yeah, sandwich. Now baby. there's awkward photographs of, of Corbyn. He hasn't really done anything yet. He hasn't really said anything yet. And I just see the next five years yeah. there being photographs of him and ridicule of him. You should do it for the Tories a bit more, Steve. It's jolly good paper. fun. Why well, don't you do a bit more for the Tories? Okay, well, let's see. It's a Tory party conference. Let's, we'll see let's who have we some are. embarrassing pictures of, of David Cameron with his nose. 
pressed up against. There'll be plenty. Of, I think we. I think we did cover the embarrassment of David Cameron uh, last week involving uh, whatever that That's did true. involve. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Um, Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> Corbyn to pledge to put kindness back into British politics. Which, and there this, is a, is, this is no top-down politics. Yeah, and there is a kind of point to this, which is that he is trying to say. And I think with some justification, people don't like the falsity of a uniform position of politicians all of a sudden uh, pushing all of their ideas into one place and totally agreeing with them. But so th he... that's called a manifesto eventually, though, Well, isn't it is. It? And that's the point. He's got to try and balance idealism and pragmatism. At the minute, this is a rejection of pragmatism, which epitomised by Blair, which basically said, we'll do what we can to get elected, to someone who actually, we've got to give him the, 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 the justification of saying he says what he believes. Now, at some point, you're exactly right. That will have to shift from being an airy-fairy, let's all sit cross-legged and uh, do daisy chains and, and say what we think, to here are ten things that we believe and we want to be voted for and actually people at home will say we trust you to run the economy, we trust you to run the defence mm. of the realm and we're therefore going to vote for you. And what most people cannot see is Corbyn going from 250,000 ardent, ardent people on the left voting to him to 12 million people voting for him because they believe he will ru he'll rule the country there properly. There are some appealing little bits, though. If you look here, yes. welfare pledge to help the growing number of self-employed. There is an argument that in I'm this great that. recession... <laughs> well, absolutely. As a self-employed person... A lot of people have turned to self-employment yes. in order to keep and the wolf from the door. And, have been and they're encouraged. not supported. They're not supported. You don't have... You don't, you know, it, it takes a lot of temerity and guts, mm. I would say, certainly, to be a self-employed or, or freelance person. I certainly uh, would, would go for this. More self-employed people than ever, you are out on a limb, this sort yeah. of thing. But can, be can the state afford to pay for maternity support for, well, for the legions of self-employed? Well, probably not. And the, the problem that the Labour Party have got is the solution in this idealistic world is for the state to always intervene more and more. Mm. And that comes at a cost. And one of the things that people say correctly is when you start talking about anti-austerity as an ideal, the actual question is, where's the money coming from to stop cuts, to actually invest more in the state rather than less at a time when there is less rather than more? And I think that's a legitimate criticism you get of, of these type of policies, because in an ideal world, there'll be all sorts of... It comes of, from more tax. Yeah, and taxing, yeah. and, and <coughs> do, we, do we historically ever wish to live in a, in a society that's taxed more? And if you look at the Washington fully? Express page down here, it's about getting corporations to pay tax, of course, which we've, we've heard from multiple parties, to be fair, haven't we? But uh, very loud and clear. Yes, from one of the today. reviews uh, that uh, McDonnell was talking about today was a review into HMRC to see if they could do mm. more to, to close these loopholes that major corporations that take in billions in profits uh, are able to exploit in order to not pay tax in this country. I don't think there are many people in this country who would disagree with that. He talked about other things to do with uh, tax breaks for, for buy-to-let landlords. Um, and I think that is going to go down well, this idea of uh, corporate welfare, I think it's quite a, a clever term to have, have coined because... Which, uh, meant, which meant what in that context? It, it means the benefits that corporations are getting from the government for just doing their job and, and it also is it is drawing on the idea that it's not just the poor that get hand, handouts from governments, it's also big corporations too and individuals that have a lot of money that get certain kinds of tax breaks. I think that is going to, to play very well within a certain pe sector of voters. And as an idea it is, a, it is thoroughly laudable to say oh, we'll generate billions of pounds by cracking down on tax avoidance but it, is, doesn't, it never really comes with any bottom because you can't actually find a mechanism for doing it and then it so therefore it's just an easy way of a, of a of party in opposition to say a uh, one way of getting the deficit down and one way of generating more income is effectively to get the tax uh, income up but how do you actually do it how do you get 20 billion 30 billion 40 billion the amounts that will make a difference and the practicalities of that are very hard to see yeah lots more still to come uh, including the very latest on mars life or not on the red planet back in a moment Let's go on to The Guardian, shall we? Down the bottom, the breaking news from earlier this evening. Britain's working for Islamic State to face UN sanctions. This is uh, driven by the UK government, um, presumably in order to pr sort of put people off heading to Syria to fight. Yes, this is, this is symbolic, really, isn't it? I think it's fair to say. Which that is a synonym for not very useful, I would imagine. Yes, well, they'll it, face UN travel bans. Asset freeze. Uh, they, Which means they, they couldn't come back to the UK. No, but we, we kind of knew that already. That was already their plan. Mm. They, the thing that's interesting for, for me in this is that Cameron is, is going to call for a 
creation of a £10 million anti-ISIS propaganda unit based in London, which I think is a very good idea. We have to counteract this tide of, of incredible terribleness that's going on online and, and show the reality of it. The fact is, though, that there have been quite a few excellent television documentaries that have managed to get yeah. inside ISIS or um, television and, and, and online documentaries or talk to people who have escaped ISIS and... Uh, you know, we, we've, we have already seen another side, but it's a question of targeting the people who are, who are being beguiled uh, by the terrible romanticism in the ISIS-produced propaganda. Mm. I think that is probably going to have more of an effect than any UN travel. Unless this glorifies them. We don't know that. Well, we've got pictures of all of them right. as well. Well, there we is now? something of an argument that if you have to really mm. use propaganda to, to, to highlight the negative aspects of life under ISIS, you've got to imagine that the people who are beguiled by it are probably not worth retaining <laughs> to be of that level of sort of crass stupidity of whatever age to look at ISIS and think well that's a romantic lifestyle. Yes but the problem because is that they, it's not just about not retaining them is they might go over there and learn things that would kill more of us or more people All I'm saying is if you, have to, so if you have to kind of convince them that ISIS is probably a bad thing uh, they're not the, the greatest assets, mentally speaking. No. I, 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 I uh, meanwhile, yes, on, agree with that. on Syria, the cold piece, the uh, uh -huh. headline there in The Independent, buoyant Putin lambasts enormous mistake in not working with Assad. Well, we have a situation now where President Assad is propped up in order to continue the fight well, but, against Islamic well, State. Well, this is exactly the problem. That Obama is fundamentally opposed to that. And he said in his speech that Assad is a, is a tyrant who dropped barrel loads of chemicals on his own people. And Putin then stands up separately in another speech and says, Assad is a, is a legitimate leader uh, in Syria. And there is an argument, which uh, Jenny's articulated as well, that you have to find another way of doing things, and that might mean sitting down with your enemy's enemy on the mm. basis that must make him the friend. But it's very hard to see how Obama and Putin's position can actually be reconciled. I think Obama's position was that after this is resolved, we cannot have a return to the status quo, that's what he said. And, and from that I read that perhaps he might be willing to, do, to in the short term, cooperate mm. with, with Assad in order to get rid of ISIS. I mean, clearly Assad is a tyrant, has, been, has used chemical weapons against his own people, is, is uh, an appalling dictator. However, we are in a terrible state in Syria and the efforts of the British and the French and the Americans combined have not... Mm have not come to any uh, successes there. And we have part, to do of the, we part of the background of this, of course, is to try and stop this, the, the, the tide of refugees who are living yes, in the country. Yes, of course. And, that, and that is focusing minds even more in Europe, isn't but, it? But of those, course, and also the, terrorism. It, those, you know, it's affecting us. But if the answer is Putin, the question really is unbearably bleak. But it is unbearably bleak, unfortunately, yeah. and, mean, and we've tried... We, it's been feeble. Our efforts so far have been feeble. So we have shall, to do what we can. Shall we try and cheer people up before bedtime, then? Yes. Tell, tell me more about this.